As we've seen before with this dihybrid, there are four possible output gamete types or haploid products of meiosis. There's the two non-recombinant types and then the two recombinant sets. So those ones are non-recombinant and those ones are the recombinant ones. For loci that are linked on the same chromosome, we will see something different than what we saw before. Previously, with loci that were on separate chromosomes and assorting independently, we saw that all the different possible haploid products of meiosis had the same frequency or the same probability. In the case of linkage, physical linkage now, on the same chromosome, the recombinant frequency will be less than 50%. It can range up to a maximum of 50% or be less than 50%. If these two loci are very, very far apart on the same chromosome, they will have a recombination frequency of 50%. So if you see a recombination frequency of 50%, it's formally possible that it could be two loci that are far apart on the same chromosome, or it could be more likely that they are independently assorting on separate chromosomes. But there might be other data in the question that you're working on that'll help you sort out between those two possibilities. The way that we estimate physical distance between two loci is simply to use recombination frequency. Let's say, for example, that each of these recombinant products of meiosis had a frequency of 5% or decimal 0, 05. That would mean that each of these would have probability of 0.45 each, and this would all add to 1. Now, it should be obvious that these two products of meiosis should have the same frequency. It's the exact same physical event that produces both at the same time. A crossover, as we saw in the last segment, a crossover between the loci produces big A, big B. Products of meiosis at the same time, it produces little a, little b products of meiosis. And the same events that produce these, this haploid product of meiosis also produces this one at the same time. So a way to work out the different probabilities of the products of meiosis is if you can figure out one of them, it means you can infer the rest. If you can figure out the probability of one of the recombinant gametes, then you know the other recombinant has the same value. And then you know that the other non-recombinants simultaneously have to have the same value and the whole thing has to add up to one. So this allows you to infer the probability of all the different products of meiosis if you can find out the probability of just one of them. So in this case, what we're seeing is the recombination frequency is actually 10%. Because the two recombinant gametes, two recombinant products of meiosis, add up to 10% of the total. So we said that the recombination frequency was the number of recombinants out of the total. So in this case, it comes out to decimal 0, 05 plus decimal 0, 05 out of a total of 1 or 0.10 or 10%. Or we would say, and here's the proxy for physical distance, we would say that this is 10 MAP units. MAP units is a somewhat arbitrary unit of measurement it's a physical distance. It, well, it masquerades as a physical distance, when in fact it's simply a way to represent recombination frequency. Now that we've actually sequenced genomes and measured the number of nucleotides between known loci, we've actually determined that the recombination frequency is a, a generally a very good proxy for physical distance. It's generally proportional. But seeing as it's dependent on the frequency of crossovers, different regions of the genome might have more crossovers more frequently than others. So as such, the actual number of nucleotides in a MAP unit is not a constant. It depends on what part of the genome you're in or what organism you're in, for that matter. So we refer to it as if it was a physical distance. But in fact, what we're really saying is it's a recombination frequency. Another point to make that we haven't made explicit yet is that recombination frequency is solely 
interested in what's going on in one organism and specifically what's going on in myocytes of that one organism. Now, if this is a diploid organism, say this, is, this could be pea plants or this could be horses that you're breeding, doesn't matter what it might be, the question is how do you measure recombination frequency? And the way you measure recombination frequency is you need some means of measuring the frequency of at least one of these output gamete types. Now the easiest way to do that is to use a test cross. A test cross would simply take this organism, that's a dihybrid, and cross it to something that is homozygous recessive for all the different loci involved. So what this would mean is we would effectively have a Punnett square, if we wanted to draw it out, where the only contribution possible from this parent, the tester, would be the little a, little b gamete. This will not contribute to the phenotype, as we've mentioned. The only thing that will contribute to the phenotype is whatever is coming out of the dihybrid. So we would actually be able to measure the frequency of each of these different offspring categories. And now I'm drawing out the genotypes of the offsprings where we cross this organism now with this organism. Here's the possible output gametes from this organism. Here's the one possible output gamete from this organism. And now we'll write the different genotypes of the progeny, except I'm going to write them with this type of setup to show the different inputs. So these would have four different phenotypic categories. This one would have both dominance, this one would have the B dominant and recessive for the A, homozygous recessive. This would have the big A phenotype, whatever that is, and homozygous recessive for B, and this would have both. And that would be strictly determined by what's coming in from the dihybrid. So you would be able to measure the frequencies of these different outputs based on the frequencies of the different offspring categories that you see. So these offspring categories now give you a handle on the number of gametes that are coming from this individual of the different possible haploid outputs. From this you could determine which ones are recombinant and which ones are non-recombinant and then you would be able to measure the recombination frequency, the total frequency of the recombinant products out of the total and then from there you would be able to assign a number of MAP units between the two uh, loci on the chromosome. So if, as we said before, each of these now had a frequency of 0 0.05 and these had a frequency of 0.45 to add up to 1, we would be able to see, we would be able to infer these frequencies from the frequencies of the progenies with these genotypes. And from there, we would able, be able to say that there was 10 MAP units between these two loci.